Greetings. My name is Ben, aka Downsize It, and welcome to the second day of the week of Warhammer. I know this video is coming out a little bit late on Tuesday, but hopefully, barring any issues with the uploading process, it'll be out before it's too late this evening. And for today's video, I'll be doing a very brief introduction to the lore of Warhammer 40k, and then after that, doing a brief comparison between Star Wars Armada and 40k, the two game systems, and how they compare and contrast. But first, let us start with an introduction to 40k itself, and I thought it would be really cool to actually um, watch a, a video, actually, a really cool video that came out for as a trailer for 9th edition Warhammer, is about two years ago, and I would say almost perfectly encapsulates the... Uh, the spirit and essence of 40k and I was super excited when this came out because they actually had Sisters of Battle featured you'll see so uh, uh, this is you know we'll watch let's watch it together and you guys can see uh, you know this trailer always gets me excited even though I've watched it numerous times over the past two years so I'll stop talking let's go ahead and do this uh, and watch this uh, introduction you could say introductory trailer to the universe of Warhammer 40k In the darkness between the stars, the weak and the faithless find no deliverance. We have Necrons fighting guardsmen. Gas blasters. We are raised to believe that the God Emperor watches over us. Yes, and we have a sister. But as you know, that's Order of Our Modern Lady colors. And so we are charged to cleanse the mutant, the heretic, the alien. We must not falter. We are his sword. We are his wrath. Yes. Even in the face of death, we shall not submit. Faith in the Emperor. When I saw this, I was like, yes. Is our prayer. Shield of faith. Miracles happen with the sisters. Faith is our armor. She will not be disintegrated. The Emperor protects. In battle. He offers us redemption. And for those who prove worthy, the Emperor sends forth his angels. <laughs> yeah. And we have Space Marines and for those that don't know, that's the blue, that's the Ultramarines. They're the uh, poster boys of 40k, not just of Space Marines, but of all 40k. Our Imperium is besieged. Across a thousand worlds, we fight for our survival. Scarab swarms. Those that would tear humanity down are legion. Our forces are few. Our enemies, many. Space Marines, no charging a Necron gun line. There is no mercy. And in our darkest hour, a spiteful universe awakens forgotten evils to break us. Not be broken. Chain swords, man, so classic. And then the sisters! <laughs> I it! Sisters and Astartes fighting side by side. Yet still, we stand. The last bulwark against the terror. And while and we draw and breath, we back to back. will fight. Neither with any fear. For in this new dark no hesitation. age, there is only war. All right, well, I uh, hope that was as inspiring for me as it was for you. 
I always get emotional when I see my sisters, the Saroatas, uh, fighting the good fight. And uh, gets me a little bit, uh, you know, I get a little excited. <laughs> but I love it. So uh, coming up next, uh, I will then uh, do my own little brief history. Um, actually, well, not coming up, we'll just do it now. How about that? And um, I will try to keep this as brief and succinct as possible, although that is practically impossible with 40k but we're gonna do a super cliff notes version of the history of 40k I made myself like a little outline to keep myself on track so let's do this uh quickly the history of 40k so at some time in the near future actually of our future humanity discovers warp travel and the warp is actually an alternate don't think star trek warp travel this is completely different the warp is an alternate dimension, also called the Immaterium, and that is where the Chaos Gods live. And the Chaos Gods, there are four, although technically right now in the history I'm talking about there's only three, and then there will be a fourth, but he will all, they would have always been there. It's confusing, don't worry about it. Time and space doesn't matter in the warp. And you have Korn, you have Nurgle, you have Zinch, and you have Slanesh are the four Chaos Gods, the ultimate enemy of mankind and reality in general. And it was extremely dangerous to try to travel through this warp because you could be corrupted and possessed by demons and assaulted by demonic beings. But humanity discovered a technology called a Geller Field, which protected their ships as they would traverse through the warp. And then for about 20,000 years, humanity expanded throughout the galaxy and practically conquered the galaxy almost uncontested. Because at this time, uh, I mean, there were still space orcs that they had to contend with, but they weren't that big of a threat. And uh, the Space Elves, the Aldari, they are basically in the process of doing a 10 million year binge of partying like it is 1999, like Prince said to do. Except they were partying it like it was 10 million years, non-stop. And this period of time for humanity was called the Golden Age. Although, that's what it used to be referred to. Now it is referred to as the Dark Age of Technology. And why do they refer to it that way now? Well, because... A war happened versus the Iron Men, or Men of Iron, I should say. And as in many sci-fi franchises, um, humanity tampered with AI, and the AI went out of control and nearly destroyed humanity. Uh, this was roughly around the year 20,000, uh, roughly. And uh, it was a long war, a bloody war, and after it was over, humanity won, the, and uh, they put a ban on artificial intelligence and then there became a fear of technology after that kind of almost a repugnance towards technology and then just as humanity was starting to uh, recover you can thank the elves for this the space elves and their endless partying like it was 1999 and all their debauchery and celebration uh, gave birth to the fourth chaos god Slanesh and her birthing pains in the war caused galaxy-wide warp storms for 5,000 years, and that came to be known as the Age of Strife. And the entire human civilization throughout the galaxy was shattered and split and cut off because warp travel was impossible. So without faster, light, faster than light travel, no one had any hope of relief or support. And many of these super highly advanced um, planets and etc., were um, descended into barbarism, going back to the Stone Age, Medieval Age, um, some were able to hold out, some were not, um, and some were actually completely wiped out from existence. And it was at this time on Earth where Terra turned into basically a worldwide Mad Max scene, and the Emperor of Mankind emerged. And the Emperor of Mankind is an immortal being, an immortal human, uh, quote-unquote human, air quotes, that had existed on Earth for not just millennia, but for millions of years. And throughout human civilization, he would emerge as certain iconic characters to you know, help guide humanity. Just think of famous icons throughout the history of humanity. And that was probably the emperor of mankind. But at this point, and during the Age of Strife, humanity was on the verge of being completely wiped out from existence, becoming extinct. And the emperor decided now was the time for him to reveal himself as himself and for who he truly was. And so he created from his own genetics, through genetics uh, experimentation and his own genetics, the Primarchs, his sons. And 
the Primarchs were going to be his champions to lead humans' armies to uh, reclaim uh, the galaxy, to re, uh, rediscover and reclaim the lost worlds, the millions of lost worlds that were lost during the Age of Strife, and save humanity from the horrors of the warp. But the Chaos Gods feared the Emperor, and they still do, by the way, because he is on their level. He is basically a god himself. And so they, he stole, the Chaos Gods stole the Primarchs out of their uh, birthing tubes before the Emperor could utilize them and scattered them throughout the galaxy. So the Emperor then created the Custodes and then the Space Marines. This Basically you go Primarchs, Superhuman, Custodes, still Superhuman but not quite part Primarch, and then Space Marines, which not quite Custodes but still Superhuman, and created from the gene seeds of the Primarchs. And uh, Space Marines are, you know, eight to ten foot tall superhuman warriors that uh, uh, basically, uh, well, just superhuman warriors. And I'll just leave it at that. We'll do in-depth lore videos later on as I do this to describe more of what a Space Marine is. So the Emperor then takes his army of Space Marines, reconquers Terra from the Mad Max Barbarians, then goes to Mars where he finds the tech priests of the Mechanicus have uh, maintained technology. They actually revere technology in a spiritual fashion, and the Omnisaya is their deity. And the Emperor convinced them that he is actually just a different representation of the Omnisaya and reached a pact with the Tech Priests because they had the ships, the warp-capable ships and the technology, to arm his space marines. So they go out on the Great Crusade to reclaim the lost worlds of humanity. And he also reclaims and rediscovers his lost sons, the Primarchs. But the Chaos Gods used the scattering wisely, and about half of the Primarchs were corrupted. And the Emperor's favorite son, Horus, who was chosen to be War Master as the Emperor returned to Earth. Um, Horus was to continue to the Crusade because the Emperor was going to return to Earth to work on a secret project to rid humanity of the need for the warp and for warp travel, and to end the Chaos Gods once and for all. The Chaos Gods would not have it, and they corrupted Horus, and he turned what was called the Horus Heresy, and half of the Primarchs in their space marine armies also turned. A massive civil war threatened to destroy humanity once again, and it culminated in a battle over Terra where Horus slew his brother Sanguinius, and the Emperor decided that finally he had to intervene, but he could not bring himself to kill his son Horus, but when Horus struck the Emperor down with a mortal blow, the Emperor decided that he must strike down his son, and with one of the most powerful bolts of magical psychic energy ever, obliterated Horus, not just his body, but his soul as well, making it as if Horus never actually existed. So he was completely obliterated, but the Emperor was mortally wounded, dying, you could say, even though he is immortal. And so they interred him in the Golden Throne on Terra, which was a piece of technology from the Dark Age of Technology that very few if no one even knows how it even works, but it has been sustaining the Emperor now. Uh, this was in the. This is all going in the year 30,000, by the way. And so it sustains the Emperor, and he uses his will to sustain the Astronomicon, which is a beacon that shines in the warp. Think of it as a North Star or a guidepost for traversing the warp. And he has remained this way for 10,000 years. And we will jump forward to the year now 40,000, the name of the game or of the actual game, and uh, the Imperium of Man still stretches across millions of worlds, and it's beset on all sides from horrors of many different, from Xenos to demons um, to heretics within. And when the Horse Heresy, uh, 10,000 years ago, when the Horse Heresy armies were defeated, they retreated into the Eye of Terror, which was a rift in space that led directly into the warp in the realm of demons. And... Uh, about a hundred years ago in the current timeline, um, the Abaddon to the Spoiler, one of the leaders of the legions of uh, the demons and the and the uh, the uh, Chaos legions, the traitor legions, succeeded in destroying Cadia, and Cadia broke before the guard did. And it allowed a massive rent to tear throughout the entire galaxy, splitting the galaxy in half. And it is called the Cicatrix Maledictum, a warp rift that is cut off the Imperium. We have the Imperium Sanctus in the Galactic South that still is bathed in the light of the Emperor's Astronomicon. But then you have the Imperium Nihilus, which is, Nihilus, which is cut off and is beset on all sides. And then when all 
thought everyone thought it was lost. One of the Primarchs had returned, for all the Primarchs had been lost and killed. Gilliman was resurrected, the the Primarch of the Ultramarines, and he has retaken control of the Imperium and has started the Indomitus Crusade. And all of the forces of the Imperium are now stretching out and spreading out to try to relieve all of the worlds beset, even trying to pierce the Sigatrix Maledictum to save the worlds in the Imperium Nihilus. And so the Imperium of Man is beset on all sides by, again, we have Xenos, we have demons, and we have heretics. And I'll go into the specifics of all the different races later at some point. But to finish off this super quick recap of what's going on in 40k, I will read the entry. This, by the way, is the rulebook to 9th edition 40k. You can see how thick that is. The first half is a lot of lore, which I love reading about the lore. But the opening to the book is what I shall read. And it should be a perfect recap and a fitting uh, conclusion to an introduction to the lore of 40k. For more than a hundred centuries, the Emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind. By the might of his inexhaustible armies, a million worlds stand against the dark. Yet he is a rotting carcass, the Carrion Lord of the Imperium, held in life by marvels from the dark age of technology and the thousand souls sacrificed each day so his may continue to burn. Hang on a second. Who wrote this? This is not an approved text. Um... Whoever at GW wrote this, uh, you're getting a phone call. Yes? Yep. You might want to take that call and report for questioning. Uh, we might need to have a rewording of how this is written, because the Holy Emperor is divine. He is not a rotting carcass and carrying a lord. He lives, and he protects us all with his divine light from the Astronomicon. Yeah. Obviously, someone of the Imperium did not write this, and this was not, improved, not approved by the Inquisition. Let us continue. To be a man in such times to be, is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. It is also to suffer an eternity of carnage and slaughter. It is to have cries of anguish and sorrow drowned by the thirsting laughter of dark gods. This is a dark and terrible era where you will find little comfort of hope. Forget the power of technology and science. Forget the promise of progress and advancement. Forget any notion of common humanity or compassion. There is no peace amongst the stars, for in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. Although there is hope, if you have faith in the Emperor, there will always be hope for mankind. Do not falter in your faith. So, super fast recap and review and introduction of the lore of 40k, and I'll be going into more detail and specifics of the lore 40k probably for several years i'm going to try to do a lore video a week do some deep dives into specific aspects of the 40k lore and the races and technology and factions etc and uh but for today's video the second half coming up next i'll be discussing the differences between star wars armada and warhammer 40k the two game systems and how they play etc Okay, so let's just do a. I'm just going to do a quick comparison between our modern 40k. I don't want to. I don't want to do any deep dives into how to play the game. Uh, this is not going to be a you know a how to play Star Wars Armada or how to play Warhammer 40k. Just a, a brief comparison on how the rules differ and how the games differ, etc. So first, let's start off with Star Wars Armada. What people familiar with my channel know, because uh, that's uh, what you guys are used to. And if you're new to the channel or coming over from 40k, I just want to give you a brief description. So first off, obviously, Star Wars Armada is set in the Star Wars universe. And it is a tabletop game where you play um, of large uh, scale. So large ship scale. Think of like if Battlefleet Gothic was a tabletop game. I know it used to be. Maybe it'll bring it back again. And have maybe like a Battlefleet Gothic Armada style game. That would be pretty cool. But uh, you have ships like Star Destroyers and uh, Corellian Corvettes and uh, Separatist droid frigates and original Venator Star Destroyers from the Clone Wars. And then you have squadrons that are about this big that represent all the fleets of squadrons or wings of squadrons flying around the battlefield. And how you build a fleet is that each ship has a ship card 
and each card has a number of upgrades that can be, uh, and types of upgrades that can be attached to that card. And they're all worth different victory, or victory, uh, build points. And each game of uh, Star Wars Armada traditionally is a 400 point game. That's the standard size game for an Armada game. And once you've built your fleet, um, um, ba after picking your uh, faction, whether Imperial, Rebel, um, Galactic Republic, or Separatist, you then um, uh, meet on the battlefield and you pick three missions when you build your fleet. So this is how missions work. So you have three missions, you pick one from each of the three different categories, and whoever has the least amount of points or the bid gets to uh, determine if they want to be first or second player, and if there's a tie, you roll off. And the second player is whose missions that you utilize, the first player gets to pick the second player's mission. And most missions give a, an advantage to the second player. And how you play Armada is that you have a command value on your ships, and these are com you, and, uh, these are the number of command dials you have to have assigned to your ship at all times. And command dials are orders you give to your ships to perform uh, uh, bonus actions, you could say. And the larger the ship, the more command dials you have to have to represent um, the time it takes on a, a large starship like a Star Destroyer for orders to go down the chain of command in order to be enacted on the battlefield. Whereas like a Corellian Corvette only needs one command dial because they can make changes a lot faster and react quicker on the battlefield. And, uh, the, and the commands are not always necessary, but they are basically bonuses and benefits to, um, to your fleet. And um, also in this game, ships are always moving. It's like a sort of Newtonian physics, where uh, uh, if your ship is at, at speed one, your ship will go speed one forever until you decide to change it with a nav command. Um, and you need nav commands to adjust your speed. And squadron commands to command your squadrons. And concentrate fire commands to help you shoot better. And engineering commands to repair your ships. And uh, one of the key differences in Armada between four, not just 40k but almost any other war game I've ever played is that in Armada when you're doing your attack sequence you shoot first then you move which is another area we have to plan ahead not only do you have to plan ahead your commands for your large ships you have to plan ahead your shooting so it's really neat when it comes to a strategic and tactical gameplay when thinking about things is you have to think of where is your enemy going to be where are you going to be next turn and will, will you be able to shoot then because you can't move into position and then shoot. So it's a really neat dynamic that I like about it, of the, the strategy of it and having to plan ahead, etc. And, um, and the other main difference between Armada and 40k, and this is where 40k is unique and Armada is the same for almost all war games, is that it's alternating activations. You have turn one and then player one activates a ship and completes its activation, then player two activates a ship, completes their activation, and back and forth. Whereas in 40k, First player does everything with their entire army, and the second player does everything with their entire, entire army. And another comment I would like to make more is, is that uh, a difference between the two games, um, just from the Armada side, is that Armada is, a, I would say, for my own personal opinion, a very stable game and a very balanced game. I know uh, uh, some Armada players might take issue with that statement, I think, but I think that Armada, Armada is one of the most balanced games I've ever played and well-written uh, games I've ever played. And it's very stable. Um, yes, there are issues. There are balance issues. I do understand. But they're not game-breaking. And uh, I will say no fleet is unbeatable in Armada. And uh, yes, that includes honor your fleets. Um, one of these days I'm going to do a strategy video for how to... Uh, the effective ways to counter an honor and defeat an honor Because it's not unbeatable. It actually can be relatively easy depending on the speed of your fleet, etc. Anyway... I'm, I'm getting off topic and probably going to have some comments in the comments for people dissenting. But anyway, overall, Armada is a very stable game. And I th and cons when you do comparisons, especially a certain game I'm about to compare it to, a very balanced game. So, now let's compare it to 40k for those that might not be familiar with 40k. And I'll stay on the topic of balance and stability. Warhammer 40k is not a balanced game. And it is not a stable game. It is a game in constant flux. Um, you heard me say that, you know, the game is currently in 9th edition. That it means it has gone through 9 rules revisions and changes where every time they do it, you have to buy one of these big books for the new rules. And for each army you have, 
you have to buy their codex for specific army rules. It is a much more, I would say it's a much more difficult game to get started in than it is Armada. Armada is extremely simple to get into, um, and far cheaper to get into and invest than 40k is. I mean, unfortunately, 40k does have the problem, and it's had this problem ever since its inception, um, especially since I started playing with 8th edition, but just from talking to my friends that have been playing it since the beginning, of power creep and chasing the meta, and, uh, you know, for example... Basically, whoever's army has the most recent codex released is going to probably be one of the strongest armies in the game. And there are instances in this game where certain armies are unbeatable, you know, legitimately. You get, you know, a tournament, um, tooled up tournament army of, I'm just going to throw this out there, I think Drakari are at that level. And even Tau now, they had an FAQ that just came out, so maybe not. But just from watching other videos, and if you guys are, if you're 40k, be sure to comment in the comments about this, but I would like your opinions. But, you know, like, certain tooled-up Chukari lists or, like, Tau lists are legitimately unbeatable, and no matter what you bring. And certain other armies are just unplayable, like Knights, Imperial Knights. And I think even Guard are in a really bad place where, you know, if you want to play it competitively, you pretty much cannot win, no matter how good of a player you are, which is not the case with Armada. And that is the unfortunate side of 40k, but that is also the nature of be the beast with Games Workshop and their business model. Um, but, uh, let's move on away from the bad part, and I mean, that, I just get the bad out of the way, you know, that is a negative for 40k, but it doesn't deter me, because I just love the lore so much, and it's really fun to play the game and get on the tabletop with your miniatures and your models, and so, let's talk about the differences in the gameplay of 40k. So, the first one that I discussed was that, um, one player takes all their actions, and, for their entire army first, and the second player takes all their actions. This is also, a, for me, it's a negative, but I know a lot of 40k players are fine with it. They don't care. I'm used to alternating activation games, but 40k is different in that respect. And uh, I think 40k could go to alternating activations, but I know a lot of uh, hardcore, or not even hardcore, just normal 40k players would think that would take way too long to complete games, and I do understand that. But uh, how it works is, you build an army, and armies can rank, are, are usually around 2,000 points. That's the standard for a 40k game is 2,000 points, or 100 power level. And power level is an easier way to put an army together, a more narrative way than it is points. Because when you build it by points, you have to pay for each individual model and each individual weapon on the model, depending if you're doing upgrades and stuff. So it can get, you would definitely need a calculator and a piece of paper when you build your armies points-wise. Um, but you can do a lot of fight fine-tuning that way of your army to specialize it, etc., which is really cool and really neat. And when you build your army, you have to build it, put it into a detachment. And detachments are orders of battle, like a patrol detachment, or a battalion, or a brigade, or a vanguard. And they have different slots, because each unit has a different category, categorization. So for example, for my sisters, I have a cannoness who is a headquarters, and Celestine is also a headquarters. And every detachment has to have at least one headquarters, one leader in the detachment. And then you have basic troops, which would be like my basic battle sisters. And certain detachments require a certain number of troops to fill out certain slots. And then, like, say, in a battalion detachment, you have to have two headquarters, and you have have three troops. And then there's extra optional slots you can fill out, but you cannot exceed the slots. So let's say um, I want to bring a lot of elites, because sisters are have, like, their elite units. I can have six elites in a battalion detachment. Six elite units. Um, but I can't go over six. There are some exceptions I can talk about later. But, uh, or not in this video, but in general, you, if you want to have seven elites, you probably would want to go then for a vanguard detachment. They let you get more elite units, etc. And so once you have your army built, once you have it battle forged, you then bring it to the table, and you can give a whole bunch of different upgrades, for like command points, extra relics, extra warlord traits, etc. And then, um, you create your battlefield, where terrain is very important. I talk about this in the game I played with Robbie at the beginning. Um, having good terrain with line of sight blocking and cover, etc., is very important in the game of 40k. I would say it's um, almost as important as uh, your armies and such, having good terrain and a good table to play on. And once you've deployed everything and you've uh, determined who the first player is, the first player takes their turn, and there are different phases throughout each turn. The first one is your command phase, where you can do special rules that take place in the command phase to issue to your army. Then you do movement, 
and uh, usually um, mo uh, everything is measured by the way using a ruler uh, like just a normal um, measuring tape and it's measured in inches which is interesting because Games Workshop is based out of the UK I wonder why they didn't do it in meters but anyway uh, it's all everything is measured in inches and so let's say my basic battle systems they can move six inches so I'd measure six inches and move them forward and then if I want them to go faster I can advance them I can roll a d6 um, and whatever I roll is an additional inches that they can move. Oh, quick note, uh, Warhammer is played with D6s, and whereas um, Armada is played with uh, specialized D8s. It's a fantasy, it was a fantasy flight game, so they, you know, of course have specialty dice that you play with, they have special icons on them, but they're essentially D8s. So, and then you have your uh, psychic phase. Psychic is magic. Uh, um, psychic powers is basically magic. And so if you have psychers in your army, they can attempt to cast spells. And then you would do your shooting phase, and that's when you do all your ranged combat. And then you do your charge phase. So if you want to charge somebody, you declare charges, and then you have to roll your dice to see if they can make the range to make the charges, etc. Then you get into the fight phase, and that's where the real carnage happens when you get into melee, where you punch and claw with swords and hammers and maces, and etc. And all kinds of fantastical equipment and weapons. And then you have your morale phase, and units can break and run and run away, and you can uh, gain victories that way by breaking an opponent's morale. Then once that done, once that is finished, you then move on to the next player's turn. Then they get to take their entire turn, and you go back and forth for five rounds. Whereas Armada is a six-round game. So that's uh, you know very very quick and brief breakdown of the difference in the rules um, and the, basically the structure of the games with Armada and uh, 40k, you know, like, uh, one last thing I'll say is that Armada has four factions, um, whereas 40k, ha I don't even know the number, I didn't even think to look it up, but tons of factions, and each faction has their own unique rules that makes them unique, and, uh, like, the Sisters of Battle are very different than the Tau, which are very different than the Orcs, which are very different than the Space Marines, and in the Space Marines, there are different chapters that are also very different from each other, so there's a lot of unique um, variety and diversity in the game of 40k which I love about it and uh, so uh, thank you guys for uh, sticking with me through the, the this very brief and truncated um, lore history of 40k and the differences between 40k and Star Wars Armada and I know it's not very detailed I just want to get make these to be uh, quick overviews and just a quick reminder to everyone if that we do have the giveaway going on just subscribe and comment on my videos once you into the giveaway. And the winner on April 1st will be able to choose between a set of downsized defense tokens, a large magnetic turn dial, or a $60 store credit to Admiral Tater's Ship Shop. This is obviously Armada gear. I know it's not great for 40k players, although the turn dials actually can be used for 40k. Actually, I'm going to be using it in my games. And um, if you're interested in shopping at Admiral Tater, who has been a friend of the channel um, for uh, almost a year and a half now, um, Garrett Vance is the proprietor. Um, use downsize at 10 for 10% off. I just want to try to remember to give those shout outs to Garrett as often as I can. So thank you guys for watching. Um, I can't wait to show off my Sisters of Battle army tomorrow when I do my army showcase, which will be coming out tomorrow on Wednesday. And I uh, can't wait to show that off to you guys. So until next time, take it easy.